I'll make sure that we have a time. Um, no, no, no. Okay, so. Yeah, you walk, you sit down, you go to class. So, a couple of
I'm going to be at JFK. No, I will be in Toronto. So I can't videotape it. I like it. Anyway, I won't be here. I won't even be in the country. So, but if he wants to videotape it, it's going to be difficult, though, to get the videotapes available to you before the final. So there's sort of no point in all of Yeah. We be talking tomorrow. Yes. My, my, I, I land Monday afternoon. Monday around three. You can show up Monday afternoon. Do it Monday night. I can show up. Do it Monday night. I can show up. I don't know that I really want to show up Monday night. Uh, I mean, I, I, I land at JFK. I think at four. Are you going to India again? No, I'm going to Canada. <laughs> don't need a don't need a pizza for Canada. Yeah. Are baby are there available for both? You can bring in Artem again. Uh, Artem is also going to Canada. Huh. Let's just so, uh, uh, with you. Well, provided his visa comes through. So wait, why do you need? Why? Because there's a. I mean, it's a conference. Why oh, I meant like, why does he need a visa? For what? Because he is not a U.S. citizen. Oh. Did you hear his accent? Oh yeah. Uh, or a Canadian citizen for that. Um, okay, so let me uh, confirm with Arthur. So let's do this for sure. Uh, and let's see if he would also be willing to do this. So best would be if we can do both. But I mean, I, this room is available. I know it's available. I don't have a room here. Rooms are harder to get on the reading day. But I will see if both can be done. Okay. Um, in terms of Monday, in terms of Monday afternoon, are there people with a conflict Monday afternoon? Are there people with any sort of time restrictions Monday afternoon? I mean, later would be better. <laughs> later is better. No, Monday six a.m. Later is better. For you. So, so we can try and do it sort of at class time on Monday. Right, because most of you, if you have a non-Stony Brook commitment, you probably do not have a Stony a non-Stony Brook commitment. For example, around four o'clock on Mondays, because you kind of do something else at four o'clock on Mondays. So let's try for four p.m. If you know it. Provided that he is available at all. Okay, so let's we'll try for that. I don't know. I will post whatever the results of this are on the web page, and I will go on Blackboard and send an email to everybody. Yeah. Yeah, everything. Here we go. Yeah, let me discuss that. I'd like to try and get through at least a little bit about Stokes' theorem and Gauss's theorem before we do that, and then I'll come back to that. Um, yeah, and surface integrals. <laughs> right? Okay. So, okay. So let me remind you. So Green's theorem. Let me write it as as Stokes' theorem in the plane. Well, let me write it in different. So this is Stokes in the plane. And I'll say more about that in a second. It says that if my region is nice, whatever the heck that means, it has finitely many holes, positively oriented boundaries, blah, 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 blah. And gamma is the boundary D. So I have something that looks like, I don't know, this. This is D. Here is gamma. Right, so this is also part of gamma. Uh, then the line integral over gamma. Oh, and so I guess I need to say something about my vector field. My vector field has goodness. 
So my vector field is continuously differentiable. And since we're in the plane, it consists of two pieces, P and Q. Then, if I want to integrate the line integral over gamma of P dx plus Q dy, then this is the same thing. And let me actually write it as a double integral to emphasize that it is a double integral. This is the integral over the inside of the curl of F. Uh, uh, let me write dx dy. Of course, it might be dy dx, but whatever. OK? So that means that we can turn appropriately chosen double integrals into line integrals over the boundary or line integrals over closed curves into double integrals. And there he is. OK. So you were asking me something that I didn't quite understand. Like one where you said, like, we have to follow, follow it in the direction that the surface is on the left. Yeah, so, so let, me, let me not do, but kind of do. Suppose, suppose we have, I'll just sort of set this up, but not really. Suppose that we have this ring, this annulus, where this is the circle of radius, I don't know, 1, and this is the circle of radius 2. We have some vector field. Uh, I mean, should I do it fully? Or yeah. we're okay with yeah. it? Do it fully. Okay. So suppose this is my curve here and here. And so gamma is both of these together, right? Let's call this gamma 1 and this gamma. How about we call this gamma 2 because it has radius 2 and this gamma 1. So, and. Uh, what function do I want to integrate? Uh, I want some vector field. It doesn't really matter. How about let's do the vector field. I'm just going to set it up anyway, right? So let's do minus y x. Okay, so that's my vector field. That's my region. And so The line integral over gamma of, of the curl, so the cur I guess let's do the curl of f. So that means that the, the planar curl of f is d dx of x. Oh, that's a stupid one, huh? It means zero. Yeah. yeah. Do negative y squared. Oh, yeah. Ooh. X squared. <laughs> okay, sure. D dx of x squared, since I'm just setting it up, it doesn't matter. Uh, D dx of x squared minus D dy of y squared negative. That's the curl, which is 2x minus plus 2y. <clears throat> so Green's theorem says in this case that the line integral over, let me write it as gamma 1 using gamma 2, of this, 2x plus 2, yes, no, wrong, duh, of minus y squared dx plus x squared dy is the same thing as the double integral over this region, let me not parameterize it yet, of 2x plus 2y dy dx, or dx dy, I don't care. Right? That's what Green's theorem says. So what does that really mean? So in this case, I can do this integral in two ways. So one way is I can parameterize these two curves. So I can write gamma 1 as the curve so I'm going this way, so that would be cosine minus t, sine minus t.
I know this simplifies as t goes from 0 to 2 pi. Cosine of minus t is the same as cosine of t. Sine of minus t is the same as minus sine of t. Again, t goes from 0 to 2 pi. So that's my inner curve. Since I brought cover, I guess I can use it. That's my blue curve. Here. Like that. And my other curve, gamma 2, can just be 2 cosine t to sine t. Again, t going from 0 to 2 pi. Yeah? In that case, t is negative because you're tracing the, the uh, wrong way. Right, the clockwise. I'm really thinking of t as theta. Right. And so I could write it going from negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, cool. And you can parameterize it other ways. It doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't. Let's do that. OK, so let's just write out what this guy is. This is not the best way to do this, but let's write out what it is. This is, so y, let's over gamma. So this is the line integral over the blue curve of minus y squared dx plus x squared dy plus the line integral over the black curve of minus x squared dx plus, oops, 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 y squared dx plus x squared dy, right? So I just do them separately. Uh, for this blue curve, y is cosine t, x is my, I'm sorry, x is, co so on the blue curve, x is cosine t, y is sine t negative, dx is the derivative of this is minus sine t dt, dy, so just emphasize they go together, dy is minus cosine t dt, not t d. That's what we have on the blue curve. On the black curve, x is 2 times cosine t sine t and dx dy is 2 times uh, minus sine t dt cosine t dt, like that, just doing ordinary stuff. So this is, now we can just plug in, this is an ordinary integral now, a regular one-dimensional integral of um, minus cosine t, I'll just put the square there, times dx, which is minus sine t, so dt, right? This is x, this is minus y squared, dx, did I write sine dy, uh, sorry, so another cosine, right, so minus y squared, minus y squared, jeez, <laughs> so minus y squared, y is sine, so that's minus sine squared t, this is minus y squared. dx is minus sine t, dt. That's the first bit. We're going from 0 to 2 pi. Plus, then the next bit. We have x squared, which is cosine squared t. D, dy, which is minus sine t dt. <laughs> Probably it is, yes. Okay, so that's what we have. 
And that integral kind of sucks. Right? This is sine cubed t plus cosine minus cosine cubed t dt 0 to 2 pi. Kind of sucks. It's doable, but it's not my friend. <laughs> That's only part of it. Right? The other part is almost the same. So let's get the other part. 0 to 2 pi. You got this. Huh? You got it? I should just go on? No, no, I mean like you got it. You got it. You do it. Well, no, I think both. It's, it's just for it. Yeah. After eight. Huh? I think we understand why we don't want to do this. Well, it's not. Sometimes it's the easiest way. But not in this case. But not in this case. So, okay. So minus y squared dx. Same, same nonsense here. No, it's a different curve. So that's sine squared t is minus sine squared t is minus y squared. dx is minus sine t dt. In fact, I think it's the same, right? Well, just there's a factor of eight. Yeah, there's a, and I lost the factor of two. Right, because there's a two here. Well, yeah, it's, it's two three two. So and there's a two here, so I really lost two twos. We didn't choose three twos. <laughs> Sine squared. Oh, it's squared. It's three twos. Yes, three twos. Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> Eight. It's three twos that I lost. Uh, and then here, um, I've lost track of what the thing is. Uh, X squared dy. So that's cosine cubed t, and dy is. But one of these is minus. No, that's the top one. It's just so this is a co cosine q t dt. Yeah. Was this one minus? No. Dx was 2. I already changed the minus. OK. So I get the same thing. So this gives me a 9. Uh, 1 minus 1 plus. Yeah, 1 minus 1 plus. So it's oh, that sucks. OK. <laughs> oh, my god. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there it is. You don't want to do it anyway. Okay, so there's that. The other way, which is easier, is we do Green's theorem. We turn it into a double integral, but we really want to do the double integral in polar coordinates. If you want it, if you do it in rectangular coordinates, your life is horrible. Because you have to split it up in these four regions. You don't want to do that. But in polar coordinates, it is not bad because we just integrate r goes from 1 to 2, and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. And we integrate uh, 2x plus 2y. So that's 2. x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta. R dr d theta. That's easy. Right? This is just 2 times the integral from 1 to 2, r squared dr cosine somewhere. Cosine theta plus sine theta. Uh, I wrote it backwards. d theta dr, the way I wrote it. I can do a dr d theta, it doesn't matter. So that's an easy interval. Yeah. You, you wait. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one is going clockwise and the other two is going counterclockwise. Yes. You should just push them together. Yeah. So for Green's theorem, I need the things to be oriented so that when I walk on the curve, my left hand can touch the inside. So when I walk on this curve, going this way, again, that same hand is touching the inside. So this is oriented correctly for me. If this had been oriented this way, it would have had to work a little harder to, to use Green's theorem. Okay? But we could do that in a situation. But it's not. So, yay. <laughs> there, there was, you're gone. Okay, yeah. 
If the inside were oriented counterclockwise, yeah. what, uh, how would that change the answer? Like, would it just would it would it just negate it or? Well, so, so here, because here because gamma has in, in this in this orientation, this would be minus. Yeah. Oh, so that's right. easy. Okay. So you should but, think about it in Green's theorem. Uh, I think we kind of have to do this guy minus the little guy. I see. Oh, wait, isn't that Okay. Right? We do the double integral of this guy minus the little guy, which okay. will be slightly different but very close. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because you're just doing both. Like right. Like so even if even if this guy blew up out here, I don't care. Yeah. Oh, so that's so still all that. All of that still works. Yeah. Right now, the So this is measuring. I mean, in terms of physical whatever. This is measuring the circulation of the so. It depends on what your intuition is. If you're thinking in terms of physics and forces and stuff, this is the circulation of this physics of this. This is measuring this vector field, how much twistiness or how far away from being gradient this vector field has during the average over this area. Right. So how much twistiness there is of this vector field over this area, if, if you're thinking in terms of physics. If you're thinking in terms of, I see you in just a second. Uh, if you're thinking just another, another interpretation, if we think of it as a line integral, this is how much work to drag something around this part, this path, and then also to drag it the other way. I mean, you have, you know, you have two, two things. You're going to drag this around here and this the other way, and how much work was that? It's the same. Seeing that they're the same, I don't have physical intuition. I'm not a physicist. It doesn't seem to me that they're the same, but they are. Yeah? Um, what, how would we set, if, if it was oriented the other way in the center, how would we re set up the uh, double integral? Uh, well, so we'd have to think of it as really two, two things that we subtract. Right, so we would, we, this would be, instead of integrating from just one to two, I would integrate from zero to two and subtract off the other integral. Is that the definition? Yeah, wait, is it those? Wouldn't you add one zero to one? Yeah, I would add, I'm sorry. Yeah, because yeah. I have to reverse it. Yeah, okay. So you would just go from zero to two. I would go from zero to two, but I would have to add. You like going from zero to one twice, and one to two. I think I count the middle twice. Yeah. Because it's not this problem. This problem is the zero to two problem, and this is the zero to one problem. And they're both oriented the right way. Yeah, so I think I Okay. We're good? Okay. This, yeah. Oh no, that means yeah. Okay, I thought that was a thing, but it's no, it's a thumb. <laughs> Always <laughs> it's a thumbs are fingers, but no, they're thumbs. I okay, good. So let's move away from Green's theorem, but not quite. So this is called Stokes theorem in the plane, which if we can make sense of it, it's exactly the same theorem in higher dimensions. Whatever that means. So I need to say what that means. But then there's another version. So I'm going to erase this example and leave that. I can erase that. Well, sorry. So there's another friend. It's called Gauss's theorem, which also goes by the name divergence theorem. So there's another, and I still want to just talk in the plane for a minute, which Instead of measuring the curl or the circulation of my vector field, 
I suppose what I want to measure, and let's just say I have a similar region, there it is. I have some vector field, and I have some stuff flowing around in the plane. Actually, it's using the same vector, it's so funny, doesn't it? I have some, some vector field. I don't want it to be all this way. Some vector field. <laughs> This is a bad vector field. I have some vector field like this. Stuff flows through this region. I could think of this, so so what I might be interested in is what's called the flux. Over my region. I guess I call it G, so I'll still call it Which is the amount of stuff, in fact, instead of drawing it that way, I'm sorry. Wow. But let's draw it this way. <laughs> this one's easier to draw. Okay. So I have some, think of it as, you know, electrical current or whatever. Not electric, anyway. Think of it as stuff flowing. And I want to know how much stuff that flows according to this vector field is created or lost as we flow through this region. So we think of this, well, okay. Yeah. We're thinking of this in terms of meteoro meteorology, and these are wind currents, then we want to know whether we have, looks to me like we're you know, going to a more low pressure zone. Stuff is spreading out. So I want to compute how much is gained or lost as we traverse D. Right? Yeah. By how much? How much area? Yeah. Okay. Think of it as area. So I have a I have a sort of a unit area here, and as it flows through here, there's some gain or loss due to the stretching of the vector field. But I'm really thinking of you know sort of things are added. Things go into D here the way my vector field is. Things come in here, so if I take this curve, it flows in and then it flows out, and I get more stuff out than I got in. Can I just ask, like, when, mm -hmm. when I was studying, like, divergence is it's negative like, and, like, positive. Yeah. And that's confusing because I would have expected it to be just, like, less than one or positive. So, how, like, how do you think, you know what I mean? Like, how do you think It's about the exponential. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So if you exponentiate oh. divergence, then you get it. So, oh. yeah. Uh, okay, because we're... Yeah. Integrating is like exponentiating in some sense. Uh, now, I've lost it. Okay, so I want to know sort of the net amount lost or gain as the stuff flows through D. So that would be, I mean, we already know how to do that in terms of a line integral. That would be, I just compute I just compute the dot product of the vector field with the normal vectors as I go around this curve. So that should be, well, it's not zero if the, if the vector field is, is zero. Yeah. If the vector field is divergence free, then it's zero. But if the vector field is not divergence free, then it's not zero. So that should be the integral, let's call this curve gamma, over gamma of F dotted with the normal vector. Uh, yeah. Let's write it that way. It's the dot product of F with the normal vector. That measures you know, how much is gained here. It is the projection of the thing on in the red direction. And here, since it goes the other way, this projection is negative. So the stuff coming in cancels out with the stuff going out, and we can just project, we can just calculate that. And so Gauss's theorem in the plane says that, what's the differential? Uh, D x vector, D, D, you know, so, so in other words, 
you parameterize everything in sight, you calculate the dot product and dt. Right, but yeah, that should be. Yeah. Right, so when I do when I do f dotted with n, I'm going to wind up with something that's going to look like p dx plus q dy, but there'll be different p's and q's in the other ones. So I'm going to get there in just a second. Well, in fact, let me get there now, rather than saying the other thing. So, so far I haven't said anything about Gauss's theorem. I've just said about flux. I'm working up to Gauss's theorem. So, now we can be clever and turn this vector field into a different vector field. Since I'm dotting with the normal, I could instead, instead of looking at this vector field, I could instead look at this vector field which is just taking all of these vectors and uh, taking perpendicular. If I'm looking at an orthogonal vector field where I've just swapped the components and changed the sign so that F and H are perpendicular to one another with the right orientation so everything is great. And so now I can actually write this in, in this form. So this is the same thing uh, as h, yeah, h dot dx. I can write it this way, which is the same if we parameterize it as minus q d. Yes, plus p dy. Yeah. So wait, this, this is R2 then? Yeah, this is all in R2 right now. Okay. Uh, in general, we could have it in R2. My, my goal for today in the next 25 minutes is to crank this up to three dimensions as well. Works in 27 dimensions too if you want. Well, curl doesn't work anyway. Yeah. I want to increase this. That's right. but, I, but this is really just the same. Now I can just use Green's theorem. Right? So by Green's theorem, this says that, oh, this is still line integral over gamma. By Green's theorem, I should have brought a Green's theorem. By Green's theorem, that just says that uh, this thing, is uh, okay. Why did I just the string is Yeah. So by Green's theorem, this is the double integral over my region D of. Well, I want to take the partial of this with respect to X, and I want to subtract off the partial of this. Uh, no, let me write it this way. It's minus to minus. This is minus minus. Uh, and let me just write it. This way. Right? So all I did is I said, okay, I don't know who P and Q are. I just want to do Green's theorem. And Green's theorem says I can turn a line integral with the proper orientation into partial of this guy with respect to partial of this guy with respect to x minus partial of this guy with respect to y and that's what it is but this is the same thing as dp dx plus dq dy which is the same as the quantity that we already talked about called the divergence of f Which is just, I mean, just for mnemonic purposes, is the same as integrating grad dotted with L. Oh, nice. Cool. So we can transform this integral relating to normals, the line integral relating to normals, into essentially, by Green's theorem, 
into a different double integral, namely integrating the divergence rather than integrating the curl over the area. And that will measure the flux. So we can measure the twistiness of the vector field by integrating the curl, or we can measure the spread outiness of the vector field by integrating the divergence. So Gauss's theorem in the plane, or the divergence theorem in the plane, says that this equals that. So F D boundary would be nice. Nice means the same stuff it always means. Uh, means that the flux is just the same conditions as same conditions. The flux of F over D is um, let's call it gamma. The flux of F over D is F dot N D, I guess it's DS. I guess it really has to be. Well, it doesn't matter. It's even Whatever. Um, is the same as the double integral of the divergence of F. Right into x dy. So again, really, these are both Green's theorem wearing slightly different clothes. And they're all Stokes' theorem wearing different clothes. Yeah. Does it work the same in three dimensions? Yeah. All right. All right. So, so there. Now I don't have to talk about Stokes' theorem, right? Cool. Stokes' theorem, here it is, provided you know what this means. And Green's theorem, I mean, Gauss's theorem. Here it is, provided you know what this means. So the problem with going to more dimensions is, what does this line integral mean? Is it a line integral? Is it a surface integral? Is it a rabbit wearing a fake beard? I don't know. <laughs> Something. So that's what I have to talk about sort of next. And I hope I will get there because I just did my first one. Okay, so let me try and set up a little bit to get there. Yeah. I'm not sure understand what flux actually means. It means spread out How about that? I don't understand why it's over an area and not over a line. <laughs> so, if you dropped a stick into a river like that, it would go on a line, not an area. Yeah, it's not a stick. I'm going to pour some paint on the river. Uh, I'm going to have an oil slick. I have an oil slick that falls down here. And then I, I let, and the river flows. And what's the oil slick over here? It can it spread out. Or maybe, maybe there will be, you know, some uh, compression. There might be all sorts of crazy stuff going. So it's, it's really the expansion of area. The flux is a measurement of how much stuff spreads out. I could have, you know, I could, I could put a, a point mass. I could put a, a drop of oil in the water and then let it flow and see where it goes. That's what? I don't know if you explain the amount passing through the surface. Yeah, it's the amount passing through the surface. So some is going to flow in. So imagine that I have some oil slick here. And or I have a you know I have a line worth of stuff here, and I let it flow, and it's going to spread out in some way, and I want to know how much is added as it crosses this region. And if if this if this vector field is conservative, the answer is none. So because it's divergence free, so there isn't any. Um, Okay, so these, so Stokes' theorem and Gauss's theorem are the same in more dimensions, provided you know what more dimensions means. So, in order to say what more dimensions means, 
we have to talk about surface integrals at least a little bit. So, we have to remember how surfaces work. So, let's just do everything in three dimensions. We can generalize to higher dimensions, but let's not. Um, so, if you remember, I have some region in, let's call it U D. And I can think of a surface as, mm, I don't want to think of it in the base. Sorry. Sorry. So, let's start. So, for a curve, I take an interval where T lives, and I throw it into space or the plane, and I get some curve gamma of T. I have a function gamma, which takes in, say, 0, 1, and gives me out a piece of a curve. For a surface, I take some square in UV land, and I apply some function G, which is a function from R2 to R3, and out will come some wiggly thing, which is a surface. This surface could bend around and underneath, it doesn't matter. The, the graphs of surfaces that we dealt, they don't bend around, but you know, this could be, well, it can't be quite a sphere unless we contract, but right, this is what we get for a surface. And furthermore, we can think about at each point, if I fix V and allow U to increase, should I have color, I should use it. I fix V and I allow U to increase. That gives me some infinitesimal direction here. And its image is going to be some vector here which is given by the partial, this is dg du, is that blue vector. And if I take an infinitesimal fix u and allow v to vary, then I'll get some other vector here, dg dv. So that gives me a pair of vectors which are both tangent to the surface. So we did this kind of thing at the beginning of the class, and then either you forgot it or you didn't. Hopefully you didn't. But we can describe what's going on in this. We have a tangent plane here, which is spanned by these two vectors, dg du and dg du dv. But now we know a little, well, we can also think, OK, what do I get if I take the cross product of those two guys? So if I look at dg du, and I'm thinking of these being at a fixed point uv. Right, so I don't want to keep writing u's and v's everywhere. But this is now, this is a vector. It's not a function. And I cross it with dg dv. This gives me a normal vector. The normal vector to, to my surface, let's write it as S, early S. Gives me my, my normal to my, my surface at UV. So I can find, so at each point actually around my surface, I have a well-defined normal based on how this guy is mapped there. And if I choose a different parameterization, so if I choose a different way of representing this by u and v, these vectors will move around, but they will move around in the same plane, because I have a given tangent plane. So at worst, my normal will point the other way. Right? So this normal vector, well, if I unitize it, so divide it by its length, then this becomes the unit normal. 
and now I either get, I get a vector which either points in or out, but doesn't depend on my parameterization. Other than whether it points in or out. Right? So this, this vector n doesn't care how I use my parameterization g, it only depends on the surface, except that it might point the wrong way. So if you think about some three-dimensional object, like a sphere, spheres are easy to visualize, then at every point on the sphere, I have an outward pointing unit normal, and then there's another one that points in, but other than that, it's unique. And this, whether it points out or in, well, there's an analogy to curves, whether I choose to traverse them this way or this way. If I have a closed curve, let me make it closed. If I have a closed curve, I can either go around with unit speed this way or I can go around with unit speed that way. And we have the same analogous thing here. If I have a closed surface, it doesn't matter if it has holes in it, I have either a normal which points out, or I have a normal which points in. But other than that, all that depends on is how I chose my tangent plane, which vector I call x, whether I'm choosing my coordinate system this way or this way. Okay? So by convention, for the same, same reason we choose counterclockwise here as our standard orientation, we choose outward pointing normals. So we say that a surface, a closed <laughs> surface, is positively oriented. This means that the normal that we choose in this parameterization points out. this way or this way. Depends on how I chose my coordinate system. And there's no canonical coordinate system to choose which one. But if I'm thinking of my skin, then this is better. I don't want to show you the other one because it'll hurt. <laughs> um, okay. Because I am a closed surface. Even if we push into my mouth, I don't want to do that. Um, okay. Your hand. <laughs> You'll have a mess. I don't want to stick my hand down. Um, okay, so we have this notion of positively oriented. Not all surfaces can be oriented, right? If we think of so, a good example of a surface which is not orientable is my white model. Um, is a Mobius right? So this is enclosed. I just make one. Okay. So, right, this guy, where I put a half twist, a Mobius script like that, is, well, it's not closed, but it's also not orientable, because if I choose an outward pointing normal, and I bring it around this Mobius strip, it comes back to an inward pointing normal. So I can't orient this guy. If I wanted to make this closed, I would have to be in four dimensions, I would get a fine model, but 
Same thing. Yeah. You're saying it's, it's not outward pointing because it points to the other side of the. Yeah, when it gets to the other side, it's now pointing the other way. But it's not pointing. Oh, that was actually a flash drive. I thought it was yeah. like a one, two. No, it's not a two. One. It's a flat thing. And so I have two orientations. But how does that close the surface? It's not. Oh, okay. I can't make one. I can't make a non-orientable surface without self-intersections in uh, space because we live in an oriented space, so we don't have a choice there. So, so sort of a standard example would be a Klein bottle, which I will try and draw here. So this goes in, but it doesn't really go in, and then inside it turns around. So this looks like a tube, except it sort of turns itself out as you go around. I guess I should turn it over the other way so you can try to fill it up, but it won't fill up. All right? But this this passing through is not really there. It's a little hard to visualize this, but I can certainly write a mapping from a collection of closed guys together. Okay. <laughs> So we're not worrying about non-orientable surfaces. And so then, uh, I ripped up my notes. Good, that's nice. Um, so, some things about the utility of this normal object. Just like we can calculate length by integrating the tangent vectors. So it's the integral, gives me the length of, uh, sorry, the length of the tangent vectors add them up, that gives you the length of, excuse me, this gives me the length of the curve. We can do a similar thing, we can compute surface area, by computing the length of these normal vectors. But I have to do the double integral over the surface of the length right? I just take the cross product, which this is just the normal vector. And I integrate it over the surface, I integrate its length over the surface, and this gives me the area. Why does this give me the area? Well, one thing that I didn't emphasize is if we have two vectors u and v, and we take their cross product, then the area of the parallelogram they span is the length of u cross v. And so because of that fact, if I integrate all of these little parallelograms over the surface, it gives me the surface area. I'm almost ready to state, no way am I going to prove it. Um, to me, higher dimensional analogs of these guys. So, just like, so just like we think of ds, as this quantity, this is my link element. This is parameterizing by, by arc length. We can parameterize by unit area. So often, uh, I don't think there's a standard notation, but often this is d sigma. It's just dg du cross dg dv, let's say du dv. So this is parameterizing by unit area rather than parameterizing by arc length. And so another way to say this is this is just integrating over my surface d sigma. Getting there. Huh? This is the surface area. Surface area, surface area. So the surface area is just what I get when I integrate the area form over the surface. 
No. But that this will not be, you know, over the whole surface, just a piece. Right? So if I want to compute the, the top half of the sphere, I can find the parameterization that maps a square. Let's say the top third of the sphere. I want this area. I can find a parameterization that maps it onto that, and I can do the double integral over that square that maps onto the uh, the stuff above the uh, what is that called up there? What is this? this Tropic of Cancer's down here. Anyway, Capricorn. Capricorn. <laughs> Capricorn. Right. So I just integrate everything north of the Tropic of Capricorn. There I go. Um, so I can integrate this over that, or it can be closed, and then I can compute the area of the whole thing. Uh, all right. So, what does what does Stokes' theorem say? So, Stokes' theorem in the plane says that if I want to integrate the curl, I mean, if I want to. I'm going to blow this. So if so, what? Okay. So let me let me let's now think of flux in terms of a surface. So suppose that I have now some surface. Let me draw it instead of with a square boundary. Let me draw it with a brown, roundish boundary. Suppose I have some surface here bounded by some curve, and I have stuff some vector field which flows through it. <coughs> let's do it open for a minute. I can also do it closed, but let's do it open for a minute. And I want to measure how much stuff passes through this net. So that would mean, what do I want to do? I want to measure this vector field dotted with the unit normal over this whole surface. So the flux over this surface, let's say of F, over my surface S, that's supposed to be a curly S, is going to be what I get when I take F, dot it with my unit normal, and I integrate it. I guess it's a triple integral now. No, it's a double integral because it's a surface. It's a volume, sorry. I integrate this over, let me just see, over my surface. The only difference is that it's a double. But, well, it's a surface integral. So, so here, let me do that. Oh. Just to oh. emphasize. Oh. No, I don't want to do that. Because I'm not oh. ready to do that. Oh. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. I'll, I'll do that in a second. <laughs> it's, it's a surface integral. Right? So it's a double integral, but it's a double integral over this surface. So in practice, what this would mean is that I have some parameterization of the surface. So suppose that G takes UV into R3 so that you know, G of some box is my surface. Right? The image of G is my surface, then that would mean that I would compute the double integral of f, which depends on three variables. So I would plug in g of uv at every point. This would now give me a vector. There's a vector field that I evaluate at each point. And I need the normal vector. So the normal vector is going to be dg du crossed with dg dv. Uh, and I take a dot product. Right? This, this is going to be, well, this needs to be at g uv. Right, this is the point. So if I can parameter, if I have a parameterization of my surface, this is my normal, well, if it's my unit normal, I have to divide by its length. 
Oh wait, we're just gonna make it. When we use the uh, D sigma, aren't we just gonna add another one? Okay, it's gonna put D sigma here. <laughs> no, but it's gonna, it's gonna Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. So in practice, I would do some calculation like this. And I would integrate over UV. Okay? What Stokes' theorem says is that this sucky integral can be turned into a line integral. The line integral over the boundary of that of the curl of f d so yeah so if we're calculating flux and we need to align this normal facing outward from the surface with the surface being closed what guarantee do we have that it's facing out of the surface Choose a positive orientation of your surface. But don't we only know that that exists if it's closed? Well, if your surface isn't closed, then this is positively oriented boundary. So then they'll match. If my if my normal goes the right way, then my boundary will be oriented the right way. And if my normal is going the other way, then my boundary is oriented the other way, so it doesn't match. And the cross product will always point out if one of them points out. So the cross product is going to or be oriented with respect to the right hand rule. So that means if you choose your orientation so that the image of U goes this way and the image of V goes that way, then the cross product will go this way. But if you chose your orientation so that the image of U goes this way and the image of V goes that way, then it goes in. So it but it will be, if, if your surface is or if it's open, then your surface is oriented. And if I do this one, then the orientation that I inherit from the boundary matches. Because if I do this one, then I put an orientation on this boundary curve based on this guy. So it goes this way. It goes this way. So it's oriented clockwise. If I put the other one that goes the wrong way, then the orientation I get will go the other way. So that's okay to me. Yeah. Okay, when we did um, flux and um, play, we used divergence and now we're using curl. Yeah, it's kind of funny, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's how it works. Um, what about the next step? Okay, and so, all right, so one more, we're almost there. So flux is f dot n v sigma. Gauss's theorem, which is the divergence theorem, is related, but not quite the same. So I, I don't, I mean, do you have a question? No. Okay. So Gauss's theorem, is still left on the board, says the same thing, except a different thing. So, so let's, let's think about what Stokes' theorem is telling us morally. We think of this curl as a kind of divergence. So in, in hand waving land, this curl is a kind of divergence. A kind of derivative, not diverse, a kind of derivative. And it says that we can integrate the derivative kind of thing over the edge, or we can integrate the function over the inside. And there's a relationship between the two. Um, Gauss's theorem says the same thing, but a different kind of inside. If I have a closed surface, oh, I guess let me say one other. No, I'll come back to that. If I have a closed surface and I want to compute the divergence of this vector field, so I can do the surface integral. So this is the surface integral of the divergence of F. Then this is the same thing as the triple integral. Oops, sorry. This is the, so this is some closed object. Think of it looking like a beam. Let's call it B for beam. So I have some B for beam. I can do a triple integral over the inside of my B for beam. Um, of f dx, 
So I can integrate my vector field. Uh, Wouldn't it be the other way? It's the other way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. So this is. So I can do this surface integral over the edge, or I can integrate the divergence over the inside. Either way. So I mean, we could keep pushing things down. You could cut it in half and do Stokes' theorem on the boundary and put it together. And blah, blah, blah. So it's this duality between derivatives and boundaries. So this is the boundary. So that's the surface. Right? If I think of B as being a solid blob, then its boundary is this surface that goes outside. So I can do the surface integral over the outside, or I can do the integral of the divergence over the inside. So Stokes' theorem. Is that three Gauss's theorem? Hmm? This is Gauss's theorem. And, okay, Gauss's theorem, just like Green's theorem, has the same thing that if it has holes in it, you have to have the right kind of orientation, and blah, 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 blah. You can do that alone. I guess one other thing that you can check is that if I take the curl on the gradient, that's zero, um, which in terms of Stokes' theorem gives us some kind of independence of surface for gradient flows. So just like we had independence of path for gradient flows, in Stokes' theorem, in higher dimension, we have independence of surface if this is the gradient of some function. If I have a preserved quantity, then I can make this be a nicer surface. If it's easier to integrate over a flat disk, then if this is a gradient flow, I just make it be a flat disk. Who cares? As long as I keep the boundary the same, I can just make it flat. If it's not gradient, then I can't do that. OK, so I've kind of run out of time. Let me, um, I don't think it's fair, actually, given that I just went nah, 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 for one class. I'm not going to ask you any Gauss's theorem or, or Stokes' theorem, but Green's theorem is fair game. Okay. Right. I won't put on the final a Stokes theorem question or a Gauss's theorem question, but I will. You can, you can expect there's a good chance there will be some kind of line integral. Or you might want to use Green's theorem. Or you might want to work really hard. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like things go in the opposite direction. That's part of Green's theorem, right? Just remember that Yo. counterclockwise is good. Yeah. There, uh, I don't know what you want. I, I will throw up the list of topics. Real quick. Yeah. 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 Y